record. So we are recording this webinar. Um, so we will have a copy of it afterwards for everybody. Um, thank you for joining us tonight on the Don't Be a Drip Rain Barrel Workshop. Um, I am going to pass it off to somebody that isn't me, um, Kevin. <laughs> Um, and he's going to get us started tonight. Thank you all for being here. All right, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Kevin Roth. Um, once this slide gets to the next slide, we can begin. All right, so again, my name is Kevin Roth. I work at the Pennypack Ecological Restoration Trust in Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania, which is uh, in Montgomery County, um, just north of Philadelphia. Uh, tonight, we also have with us Lindsay Blanton from Wissahickon Trails, and we have Ryan Newman from Tukini Tacony Frankfurt Watershed Partnership. This is a joint program between the three organizations. Uh, so we just want to say thank you for joining us. Uh, our three organizations were brought together through the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, which is a collective partnership to restore the water quality in the Delaware River, Delaware River watershed as a whole. And we all work together in the Philadelphia and Montgomery counties. Uh, the, the Delaware River Watershed Initiative is funded by the William Penn Foundation. So thanks to them, we're able to do all this great work. So this isn't exactly part of the DRWI, but we try to carry that over. So we build upon our partnership from the DRWI and carry it into our, into our everyday work. Now we're doing most of our programs uh, as a collaboration on Zoom. This is about our third or fourth workshop we've done together um, since the COVID outbreak. And we've done pretty well on Zoom. And all three of our organizations are nonprofit organizations, and we all work to improve and protect the land and water in our respective communities and watersheds. That being said, we are, none of us are funded by federal, state, or county dollars. We are mainly funded by donations, membership, and grants. This program is free tonight. However, please consider making a donation to one or all of our organizations. So with that being said, thank you for joining us, and we appreciate your support and joining the clean water community. Next slide. So what are we gonna be talking about tonight? We're gonna to be talking all about watersheds, stormwater management, and rain barrels. So we'll be talking about rain barrels, what are they, how to install them, how to take care of them, where to buy them, and then we'll be open for many questions tonight. So that's a gist of what we're going through tonight. Ryan, Lindsay, and I will all be presenting. So where do we start? Well, what is a watershed? Uh, we all live in this watershed world, so we often forget that people don't understand what a watershed is. So what you're looking at here is a picture of a watershed. And a watershed is an area of land where any precip precipitation in that area ultimately flows to a single water source. Everything is a watershed, no matter where you go, you're in a watershed, you can't escape one. So I imagine most of the people on this webinar live within the Delaware River watershed, but I could be wrong. I, for example, I live in the Pennypack watershed, which drains to the Delaware River. So just a quick question here, where does everybody live in the, you know, which watershed do you live in? Are you outside of the Delaware? Um, basically all you can put is a, the township you live in. Um, this is a good chance to practice with the note screen on the bottom of your uh, screen here. There is a chat, chat, chat section, not a note section, a chat, chat section. So if everybody can now go into the chat section and just tell us where you live. We'll wait a second while those pile in. See Delaware River, Philly, Philly, Pennypack Watershed, Lansdale, Huntington Valley, Kirkwood Cohansey, Jersey folk. All right, well, it looks like we have a lot of different people here, but it does look like most of the people within this chat all live in the Delaware River watershed. So that's great, we're all one team here. So generally that's what a watershed is. Uh, the map you're seeing here is all of the watersheds involved in the Philadelphia Watershed Partnership. As you see, there's uh, TTF, Pennypack, Wissahickon, Quessing. All of these watersheds drain uh, either directly to the Schuylkill or the Delaware. So we're all part of this greater watershed. And as you can see on this map, we can all make a difference in our watersheds. So next slide. So we talked about watersheds. Now we're going to talk about 
Well, the water cycle. A lot of you have probably seen this way back in elementary school, um, but it just remains the same. It's going to rain. There's nothing we can do to stop it, nor would we. Uh, we can, however, choose how to handle this rain. You know, do we get it off of our property as quickly as possible, sending it to an overwhelmed stream, or do we retain the rain on our property, whether it be a rain barrel, rain garden, or even just planting more trees to let it slowly drain towards the creek or allow, allow it to recharge the groundwater? How we handle runoff can make the difference. What is runoff? That leads me to the next question. What is runoff? Um, so you see from this chart, there's pervious surfaces and impervious surfaces that create runoff. Uh, what is an impervious surface? Well, impervious surfaces are any, surface, uh, any surfaces that water runs off of. Uh, these surfaces include roofs, roads, sidewalks, driveways, you name it. Pervious surfaces, however, which is what we're shooting for, are any surfaces that allow water to infiltrate into the ground. Next, we're gonna look at the difference between different types of uh, runoff. And the main takeaway from this slide is, you know, there's an urban environment with lots of cement and impervious surface. Then there's a natural environment which has pervious surface. So the main takeaway from this slide is that you can see how much more runoff comes from an urban environment with impervious surfaces? A lot more. Uh, so 55% more runoff and less water is getting into the infiltration. As you see in the natural system, um, over you know, 10%, there's 10% runoff, 25% shallow infiltration, 25% deep infiltration. So the main gist of that, like I said, uh, you can see how much more runoff comes from an urban environment, which stresses our creeks even more. Um, most of us on this webinar live in an urban suburban environment, so you know you should know exactly what I'm talking about. When it rains, that creek is roaring, especially the Penny Pack. And I, I'm sure Tookenee and Wissahickon, every time there's a significant rain, that creek is brimful and raging like a river. So um, you, what you're probably thinking now is, all right, I'm going to put it in one rain barrel, but how can I make a difference with just one rain barrel? Well, that's how we all fit in. Uh, this is a map that Ryan from TTF created to show that 54.6 of our watershed land is used as residential properties. So I take a lot from that. The largest land use in our watershed is residential. So if we're going to make an impact, we need homeowners to be involved. So you're right. Maybe one rain barrel won't do much. But if an entire neighborhood each used a rain barrel, it would make an enormous difference in the amount of runoff making its way to local creeks during a rainstorm. So for example, each rain barrel from Camel Hump, for example, Camel Hump is a, a, they produce rain barrels and sell them to the public. So for example, each rain barrel produced by Camel Hump holds 58 gallons of water. So picture a neighborhood of 500 homes with rain barrels. That's about 30,000 gallons of water that won't be rushing to the creek during a storm. That's a significant difference. So now imagine if everyone in, on this map in the red had at least one rain barrel. That's the point I want to leave you guys with tonight is that you may seem insignificant to put one rain barrel at your house, but looking at this map and thinking about those numbers, we, we, we homeowners and you have rent an apartment, anything, we can make a difference. And yeah, that one rain barrel might not do anything, but if you tell your friends and neighbors, we can all make a difference. Um, so yeah, with that, I think the next slide is questions. We're going to stop there for questions. Um, I forgot to mention in the beginning that if you have a question, you should just bring it up in the chat box at any point during this webinar. So were, were there any questions um, that you had? Feel free to type them in the chat box now. So we have one question from Julie that says, <laughs> so I guess it's not a question, it's a comment. She says, all of us can make a difference. Talk to your neighbors. How about a rain barrel at every house on your block? Um, so that brings me to a good question. I mean, how do we let people know? It seems like if most of the land use is um, residential, what's a good way to let people know about rain barrels? Well, I'd like to say that this webinar is one, one way that we try to educate the public. Um, <laughs> do this in person at the Penny Pack Trust. It was originally scheduled, but obviously now we're doing it via Zoom. And now that this is recorded. So after tonight, we're going to send this out to everybody. And the best thing you can do is tell your friends and neighbors who will listen. 
and just keep spreading the word that you know one one rain barrel can make the difference. Uh, we also do have a grant called Stream Smart where we go to houses and we look at what we could do on your property. Obviously, we're not making house calls at the moment, but that is another way we engage people and teach them about rain barrels and, and other ways they can manage stormwater on their property. Looks like we have a question here from Brandon. Brandon asks, do you have recommendations for people who live in apartments? Um, any tips for convincing landlords? <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a really good question. And that's kind of our, our entire goal as a watershed organizations is how do we convince those people who, you know, aren't as educated or have more apartments. So that, that, is, that is a good question. The best thing you can do is simply talk to your, talk to your landlord and educate them. They may, they may not know. Uh, that's the best way to go about it is simply educate them. And depending on where they live, they can get these rain barrels for almost free. So that's another thing that we're gonna cover tonight. So maybe something later in the PowerPoint will um, help you answer that. And we're always available, depending which watershed and watershed organization you live near, we're always available to do that outreach for you. So if you gave us the information, we'd be happy to do it. That's great. Julie also suggests that if you live in Philadelphia to talk to the Philadelphia Water Department because they may also have some resources. It looks like that we have another uh, comment slash question from Susan. Susan says, I have two rain barrels and have for years, but they fill without being connected to my gutters. I'm hoping to find out more information about using them with gutters. I have been a little fearful of doing that and how to handle them in the winter. My rain barrels do fill in the yard. I believe most of that will be covered tonight. And if we don't cover it tonight, which I think we will, um, just ask that question again at the end and we'll, we'll have a discussion about it. Great. Kevin, um, we also do have a poll. I don't know if we want to launch it now, but we have a poll to see how much people know about rain barrels um, now. And then we have a, another poll to see how much people know about rain barrels at the end of the presentation. So I don't know if we want to do that now or what your thoughts are. Yeah, now is a perfect time for that. We haven't really t went into rain barrels yet. So right now is a perfect time for that poll. So everybody take, pay attention to your screen. Uh, a poll should be popping up in front of you. Um, when that happens, just answer the poll. It should just be one click of the button and be as honest as possible. There's no grades for this. Hmm. It doesn't look like it's giving me the, the ability to um, share the poll. I got the poll on my screen. Oh, okay, great. If you I could just don't share. know if everyone out there, it looks like some people, yep, looks like everyone got it. Oh, good. Okay, great. Okay, we're waiting on four more, three more, three more people for the poll. Um, well, it looks like mostly everyone voted and well, we're right in the middle. It looks like the average is just a little bit. Um, so that's a really good place to be for the rain barrel webinar. We w should get you all to, I know it all by the end of this uh, PowerPoint or this Zoom meeting or whatever. I was gonna say, luckily no one said I know it all or we would have to invite them to come present with us. <laughs> so thank you all for answering the poll. I'm gonna pass this on to Lindsay Blanton. And again, thank you for coming out tonight. All right, hi, I'm Lindsay. I am with Wissahickon Trails. Uh, so I'm gonna go over a little bit about some of the stressors to our creeks and the solution. Uh, so like Kevin went over a little bit earlier, uh, when we have lots of built up surfaces, so all over you know, urban areas and then the suburban sprawl, what we have is um, kind of more and more water comes to the stream immediately when it rains instead of soaking into the ground and moving slowly to the stream. Um, I like to call this the toilet flush effect, which is gross, but it sticks in people's heads. Um, and just every time it rains, imagine all of that water rushing to the creek immediately. So this is what creates uh, our major issues um, of pollution and flooding in our, in our stream systems. So um, urban runoff and all of the water flowing off of our Suburban sprawl creates water quality issues. So when it rains, it brings all kinds of 
um, if there's any trash and litter, if there are chemicals on people's lawns, uh, motor oil on the street, um, you know, fertilizers, anything that the water picks up as it runs over your grass or our parking lots goes right to the creek. Um, so this creates a water quality issue. There's also a water quantity issue. So like I said, all of the water rushes to the creek all at once. This is what creates these flash flooding effects. So when we get a lot of rain, a steady downpour all at once, um, the, the sheer quantity of that water reaching the creek all at the same time is what causes our flooding. Um, so what may be you know, a one year storm or even a five year storm to the creek maybe feels like a 50 year storm because it gets all of that volume, we call it peak flow, all at the same time. So this is what causes flooding um, and erosion. And next slide. So the solution to this is uh, what we call green infrastructure. So picture the circumstance that I was just talking about um, as this gray funnel. So all of the water running off of our built surfaces and going right into our streams and creeks. So it's taken there by pipes and um, under road, you know, conveyances. Um, and so it just goes all in at once, creating flooding and pollution. What we want is to create a green filter. So in the picture Kevin showed previously, when we have, you know, forests and meadows and all these natural conditions, the water actually soaks into the ground. Much, much more of it soaks into the ground and less is running off. Even though we already have suburban sprawl, we can think of ways to kind of mimic that natural condition, even though we already have all these parking lots and roads and homes. Um, so these are strategies called green infrastructure, and it basically just means mimicking that natural condition with different tools. So this is a fun slide. Um, so if you imagine this being your house and uh, every time it rains, you know, the water is coming over your roof into your gutters and it just flows usually off into the street. So a lot of people's gutters, especially in the city, go right underground and right to the storm drains. Um, this is what we want to prevent from happening. This is that gray funnel situation. Um, so instead of having all the water kind of run off into the storm drains, we want to keep it on the lawns. We want to slow it down and let it filter into the ground. So green infrastructure uses things like rain barrels and rain gardens um, and other tools, native plants, to capture the water and hold it where it lands instead of running off of your property into the storm drains. So that's really the strategy of green infrastructure. Mimic natural conditions. Um, so here are some green practices. Um, in addition to learning about rain barrels tonight, there are all kinds of other things you can do in your lawn and garden um, that can help trap more water. So you can rethink your landscaping practices, um, think about uh, using native plants maybe instead of your lawn using rain barrels, uh, planting more trees. Trees take up a tremendous amount of water. Uh, redirecting your gutters. So we saw on the last slide that a lot of gutters actually go underground and direct water right to the street or right to a storm drain and just redirecting that gutter, uh, disconnecting it from the street and you know conveying it onto your lawn it can trap a greater amount of water. Um, thinking about all kinds of habitat benefits that come with planting native trees and shrubs and flowers in your yard um, and building rain gardens. Uh, I do believe there will be a rain garden workshop at some later date that has not been scheduled yet. So stay tuned for more info. Um, so I'll talk a little bit just as a teaser, I guess, on what rain gardens are. And if people want more resources, uh, please follow up with TTF, Pennypack, or Wissahickon. We all have resources on um, how you can learn more about building a rain garden. So think of a rain garden essentially as a little mini bowl. Uh, so it's kind of a, 
a depression that you create in your yard um, where you dig deep, maybe dig out some of that topsoil that doesn't drain as well and plant a lot of native plants with really deep root structures that soak up a ton of water. So essentially it's like a tiny area that you create to be a big sponge. Uh, people direct water from their roof and gutters into these rain gardens and they just soak up water. They're usually planted with lots of things that, um, as they say, like their feet. Well, rain gardens can be really tiny. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, that, that you have a huge space set aside for it or you have a really big lawn. They can be small or they can be really large. Um, so here's some pictures of rain gardens. Um, on the left, you have one that's fully planted and beautiful. On the right, you have one that's just planted. So it takes a couple years for a lot of the native plants to establish um, and grow big and beautiful like you see on the left. Um, but they are really, really beautiful gardens. Um, you can plant them with all kinds of uh, pollinator plants, uh, beautiful flowers that bloom at different times of year. Um, so it can really be a nice feature for your yard in addition to having a lot of functionality in terms of uh, soaking up those floodwaters. Um, so something kind of related to uh, rain gardens are bioswales. Uh, bioswales are really kind of more of a conveyance. So instead of having a bowl shape, they're kind of uh, usually in what we call a swale. So they can be along the side of a road, they can be kind of down a slope or a hill. Um, on the right, you see, a, again, a freshly planted bioswale. Um, that is along someone's driveway. So this was a residential swale that was planted. Um, and again, it'll take a year or two for those plants to get really big and established. Um, but you can see kind of at the top of the photo, there's a rain gutter being directed right into this bioswale. So it's gonna soak up a ton of water. Really great if you have a long skinny area to fill. Um, so again, disconnecting those downspouts. So you can see in the small picture at the bottom right, um, there's kind of a, a dark circle that looks like it's going into the ground. A lot of people's gutters go straight underground and they go right out to the street. Um, so that gives the water no time to filter. Um, it's not helping any plants in your yard. You're not holding it back. Um, so the, a very, very simple intervention you can do without you know, buying any plants or doing any gardening is to redirect these downspouts. Um, so this person is simply taking the, and you can see in the diagram over on the left, kind of removing the downspout from that grounding pipe and just installing a simple elbow and conveying the water out into your yard instead. Um, some things you want to consider when you are redirecting gutters and downspouts is to make sure that the water is moving away from your house, especially people who have, um, you know, basement flooding issues or, you know, you want to make sure that the water is not sitting next to your foundation. Um, make sure you're conveying the water away from your house. Um, there aren't any areas where it can pool and stand. Um, so in some cases, people can get longer. Um, elbows or diverters, you can either direct it right into the lawn or you can direct it into a garden area. Um, you also want to be considerate and not direct it towards like a neighbor's yard or anything like that. Um, and it's good to have kind of absorbent soils or a garden or kind of something that's going into. Um, when you do change to have your gutter, you know, going into your lawn or garden, um, try to see how it functions in the first few rains. Uh, see if there's standing water or ponding and try to make any amendments necessary. Maybe that's not a good spot in the lawn and it can go over to a garden or just kind of play with it. Okay, so now we are moving over to rain barrels. So rain barrels are the last strategy and the feature of our talk tonight on uh, green infrastructure tools. So again, this is just a way to kind of capture and retain water instead of having it all rush off of your property at once. This is a strategy to hold the water, give it time to soak into the ground later.
Uh, so there are lots of benefits to rain barrels, as Ryan will get into. Um, environmentally, as we've been talking about, it's reducing all of that runoff that's coming off of your property all at once. And ultimately, that will help us improve water quality, reduce pollution, reduce flooding. Um, there are personal benefits you can save on your water utility bill, uh, especially in the summer and spring when you're using lots of water to, you know, take care of your gardens and lawns. Using the water from your rain barrel uh, 55 gallons at a time every time it rains can really help that utility bill. Uh, also using rain barrels and other green infrastructure strategies like rain gardens and bioswales can help you with any property flooding or you know ponding or sogginess. Um, instead of having all of that water you know rush out into different problem areas you can kind of hold it and detain it and control it, um, have a little more control over what's happening on your property. Um, and lastly, community benefits. You know, uh, when there's flooding and pollutants, it kind of affects all of us. So like Ryan was saying earlier, it doesn't seem like one rain barrel that traps 55 gallons at a time will make a big difference. But over time and in each rain event, um, if all of our community members do the same thing, it really helps uh, create, you know, a community-wide effect. All right, are there any questions on that either about uh, water issues or green infrastructure practices? Well, it looks like we have a couple of questions. Um, we have one from Rebecca that says, where could we find suge suggested native plants for rain gardens? Um, and then Julie also mentioned um, that Collins Nursery and Primex are good businesses to check out and that on the TTF Watershed website, um, there is native plant info in their meadow, meadow presentation. Um, but Lindsay, do you have any other thoughts on finding native plants for rain gardens? Absolutely, so we do like to use all of our local, um, you know, businesses that supply native plants. Um, you know, at Home Depot and Lowe's, maybe they have a couple native plants, but they really have more like ornamental plants. So. We try to support those local businesses that Julie mentioned, um, and definitely there are resources. Um, if you go to any of our websites or kind of Google around, um, there's so many resources on um, what plants are good for, you know, native butterflies and, you know, good pollinator plants. Um, you know, if you have particular, like a really sunny spot or a shady spot, there's so much to play with, so many different native uh, varieties. Um, so it's just a matter of finding, you know, what you want to plant in your yard and what you think is really beautiful, and then contacting these local, you know, nurseries um, that can help you source material. Oh, and Kevin mentions Penny Pack Trust also sells native plants, and they have their plant sale coming up on May 1st and 2nd, so next weekend, Friday and Saturday. It's awesome. Any other questions before I turn it over to the main event, which is all about rain barrels. So I have one more question for you, Lindsay. Um, so I'm wondering, so as a homeowner, um, I'm very concerned about water being very close to the foundation of my home. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could tell me um, if I wanted to um, plant a rain garden and filter water away from my home. Is there a specific distance that you recommend the rain garden being away from the house? Like should it be in the middle of a lawn or would it okay be okay for it to be, you know, perhaps on the side of my home um, where some of the water could flow into it? I believe they say about 10 feet from okay. your, you know, from your foundation. Um, so, if you have space on the side of your home to move a little away and have that rain garden, that could work. Um, rain gardens also usually, uh, when, when you look at resources on how to actually design and shape and build a rain garden, in a really, really big storm, they have to have somewhere to discharge. So say it's such a big storm, uh, rain gardens can take, you know, up to 24 hours to actually drain the water that comes into them, and that's fine, and that's normal. Um, but in a really big rain event, they might top over. So you especially want it to be 
um, away from your home and you also want it to be uh, for there to be a path for the water to exit. So usually there's like a discharge point where when the rain is really, really high, um, you've built a path for it to like go out to the road or out into your lawn. Um, so that's just part of the design features of rain gardens. You want to plan for, you know, those really, really big storms like, you know, a hurricane or tropical storm where you're getting a lot of rain. You want to plan to have it away from your house for that. Thank you, Lindsay. All right, and I will turn it over to Ryan. Hello, everybody. So now I'm going to talk about all the stuff that everybody's really here for. Um, so we're going to talk about rain barrels. So we're just going to start uh, talking about like rain barrel installation. Then we're going to talk about some different sort of ways you can trick out your rain barrel, um, like painting it and adding some other things that help. We're going to talk about some maintenance tips. And then at the end, we're going to round it out with some different ways you can get a rain barrel as well. Um, so first off, we're going to start with a video clip. So unfortunately, we weren't all able to get out and sort of put in a video of all of us installing a rain barrel. So we're borrowing a clip from Rutgers. That's a, a really good video. Um, it's about nine to 10 minutes, and it just goes over the basic steps of installing the rain barrel. So we're gonna watch the video, and then we're gonna go through the steps sort of one by one, too, in the PowerPoint as well. Rain barrels connect to rain gutter downspouts and are a great way to collect and conserve stormwater runoff from your roof. The water can then be used to water your landscaping or garden during dry spells. Installing a rain barrel is a great project for do it yourself. So now we're going to play the video just let me know if you can hear it in the chat. In this video, we'll show you one method of installation. All right, is the video not loading? <laughs> oh, we need to start from the beginning. <laughs> That's why I wasn't loading. So just let me know if you're having trouble hearing it. there's no danger of the rain barrel tipping over. Use a level to check your work. Prepare and level a patch of soil a minimum of 16 by 24 inches. A base layer of gravel or crushed stone can be used to help level the ground and protect the soil from erosion. Do not use sand as it can easily erode, creating an unstable base. You'll want the barrel to be up off the ground so you can easily fill a watering bucket or attach a hose. Elevating the barrel also uses gravity and the weight of the water itself to make the water flow out of the spigot. You can use a variety of materials to create your platform, but it must be strong enough to hold the weight of a full barrel. Concrete blocks are commonly used, although stacks of bricks or heavy lumber can also work. 
Here we're using three 8 by 8 by 16 inch concrete blocks for the base as shown. Platform materials can be purchased from your local hardware, garden, or building supply store. Check to make sure your platform is level. Now we need to mark and cut our downspout. Set your rain barrel on top of the completed base. Match your choice of rigid or flexible elbow alongside your downspout. You may need to add a short piece of downspout as an extension to reach the rain barrel inlet hole. We like the discharge end to be within a half inch of the top of the rain barrel to reduce splashing. Here we are demonstrating both types of elbows. Once the elbow is lined up where you want it, make a mark across the front of the downspout. Keep the mark as level as possible. Note that the elbow will slide up and over the downspout, so your mark must be 3 to 4 inches below the top edge of the elbow. If you use a flexible elbow, positioning along the downspout is the same. Now cut the downspout. Place a piece of cardboard behind the downspout while cutting to prevent damage to your house. Since downspout material is very thin and easy to cut, use a regular hacksaw. An extra pair of hands is helpful to hold the downspout while cutting. Caution: The cut edges can be very sharp. You can now either leave the lower portion of the downspout attached behind the barrel or store it to reattach in the winter. Once the downspout is cut, new downspout fasteners will need to be installed above and below the cut. Most downspouts have two fasteners holding them to the house, one at the top and one at the bottom. Leave both original fasteners attached. Two common types of fasteners are available for home use, clips or straps. Here is how you install the strap fastener. Screw the strap onto the siding. Place the downspout against the siding and wrap the strap around the downspout so both ends overlap. Drill through the center of the strap and use a half inch screw to join the strap and the downspout together. For our installation, we are using clips to secure the lower end of the downspout. Gently push the downspout to the side, drill a starter hole through the siding, then screw in the clip. The downspout clips into the fastener. Drill starter holes into each side of the clip and secure with half inch screws. Choose your elbow and slip over the top of the downspout. Here we are showing the rigid elbow and extension. Here is the flexible elbow without using an extension. Secure your elbow to the downspout. Drill starter holes and install two screws. If you use an extension, you will need to secure it to the elbow with two screws. Now your rain barrel is ready to start harvesting rainwater. Don't forget to attach your overflow hose. When it's time to disconnect the rain barrel from the downspout for the winter, we can reconnect the entire downspout back together. 
if you used a rigid elbow for your rain barrel installation. To winterize, you'll want to replace it with a flexible elbow. Connect it using two half-inch screws. Using its ability to expand, you'll join the top and bottom downspout sections together. Extend the flex elbow straight for several inches. Lay the lower downspout section alongside and mark the end of the extended elbow. Using the hacksaw, cut away the excess piece. Now install a downspout fastener to anchor the upper end of the lower portion of the downspout. Drill a starter hole through the siding and screw in the fastener. Attach the downspout using two half inch screws. Stretch the flex elbow so it extends into the lower downspout section and secure with two half inch screws. Now your downspout is ready for the winter. So that is the end of the video here. So now I'm going to flip back over to our PowerPoint here. And like I said, we will talk briefly about then um, sort of the installation, what they just went through. And then also we will then talk about a couple other things as well. So some things that can stop. I should have stopped the video so we stop hearing the sound. Okay, so everybody can see the PowerPoint again. Okay, right? So, things to consider when you're installing the barrel then, um, which they talked about initially, is you wanna make sure that it's on level ground um, so you can get out the level and sort of see. If not, you can use soil to level the ground. Um, like they said, don't use sand or something else that might shift. Uh, the barrels can get really heavy when they're full of rain. Um, one thing they didn't really mention too, which um, through some research, using crushed stone really, like the finer crushed stone is a better option when you level it out than using rounder like P-shaped stone. It can shift more with the round stone than the crushed stone. So crushed stone is really the way to go with that. Um, so then after you sort of leveled out the location, it's important then that you elevate the barrel. That way, if you wanna put a watering can underneath it to get water, you can. Um, so you can use cinder blocks, uh, bricks. I've seen people build like little wooden shelves too, or you could do like a nice rock feature. You can sort of get pretty creative. Um, so we'll talk a little bit later about decorating your barrel too, but even sort of creating a stand for a barrel can get pretty creative as well. So now I'm briefly just gonna run through some of these steps again that they talked about and repeat them here. So you'll place the rain barrel in the location after you have the, the ground itself flattened out, the stone down, and then you sort of have your platform. You'll measure the height of the barrel, including the platform, and then you'll also measure the height of the diverter. So remember in the video they said, you want the gutter to be a little bit longer so the diverter will slide over the gutter, and then you can fasten the diverter into the gutter with screws. That way, if there's a crazy amount of water rushing through your gutter, it doesn't blow the diverter off and just bypass the rain barrel then. So when you add the barrel and diverter height together, you cut off the downspout there. So you'll use the hacksaw blade, like they said, um, use like safety goggles and then use gloves too. So when you cut the aluminum gutter, it's pretty sharp and you don't wanna cut yourself on that as well. Um, so then you'll attach the diverter. Like I said, you can use screws and they also mentioned using the gutter clips or the gutter straps to then fasten the gutter back to your house. So you can get those at Home Depot for like a dollar or two a piece. They're pretty cheap. And then also you wanna make sure that you attach the overflow hose, which we'll sort of talk about some more overflow options a little bit later as well. But the overflow hose is important. Um, so you wanna make sure that the overflow hose takes the water far enough away from your house. So think about with the rain garden where it said like 10 feet is where you wanna keep the water away from your house, running it like 10 feet away from your house then. Uh, one other sort of thing you can think about too is, with the overflow, maybe you wanna create sort of, um, maybe like a, a pond or some other sort of water feature in your front yard. You can always have the overflow or flow from the actual rain barrel itself flowing into a feature like that too. So you can really incorporate it into however you want your front yard or backyard if that's where you put your rain barrel. 
to look like as well. Um, so you see in the video and then here too, we just have our standard aluminum elbows and they showed plastic elbows in the video too. A little bit later here, we're gonna talk about some other options that you can do that don't involve really cutting the gutter, the gutter and a little bit less maintenance sort of involved too. They're a little bit pricier. You can get one of these aluminum elbows or a plastic elbow from a hardware store like Home Depot or Lowe's for under $5. So there's some cheaper options. We will talk about some other ways that you can sort of trick out your rain barrel setup as well. So overflow options. So like I said, you can use an overflow hose. Um, there's a couple other different ways you can manage the overflow too. But one thing you can do um, that I've seen, so I've only seen really two rain barrels daisy chained together like this. I'm sure you could probably try and do more, um, but usually I've only seen two rain barrels do this. So that'll be then you have twice the volume that you can contain in there. So instead of the 55 or 58 gallons, then you have 110 gallons. So you can increase the capacity. Um, one thing you want to keep in mind when you do daisy chain rain barrels together like this is that they're both on the same height. So if you put them on bricks that are, you know, 10 inches off the ground, they're both 10 inches off the ground and they're on level ground. So there's no height disparity between the two of them. If there's a varying height, the other rain barrel next to it won't fill up all the way. So it won't be functioning properly. So you want to make sure then that the they're level together. So then just the basic operation of the rain barrel. So it rains, the water flows through your gutters. Um, so this is sort of a good spot too to talk about now. You wanna make sure that your gutters are maintained. The first step of using the rain barrel is that the water flows from your roof through the gutters and then down into the barrel. So if your gutters are clogged, it's not gonna function properly and it'll overflow. And then you'll have water sitting right next to the foundation of your house. So you wanna make sure the gutters on your roof are clear and actually the gutter coming down the side of your house is clear as well. And so if a lot of rain barrels, it's tough to tell here in the picture since there's water on top, but a lot of the rain barrels you'll see have a screen on top. So you wanna make sure that screen is clear of debris then too, so that water can float through the barrel as well. Um, so one thing we'll sort of talk about too, uh, we deal with camel's hump rain barrels, like Kevin said before, so they're the rain barrels that I can talk specifically to. There's tons of different styles of rain barrels, big and small out there that you can go with. So if you have some specific questions geared towards those, we might not be able to answer specifically. Um, we do deal with camel's hump for the most part with our rain barrels. So we see here then, so you wanna use the water in your rain barrel in like three or four days. You don't wanna leave it sitting too long, especially if it's a really rainy season, you don't wanna leave the water sitting in there. So if you're not gonna use the water quite, you can just let it slowly drain out over a period of like 24 hours. Um, but there's certainly a bunch of different uses for how you can use the water in your rain barrel. And I'm gonna talk about them a little bit coming up as well. So sort of just calculating here how, the, how quickly the rain barrel can fill. Um, so we have here in a half an inch rain event with an 800 square foot roof area, you'll get about 250 gallons of water. So if you think about it, the rain barrel itself, you know, only holds 55 gallons of water. So that stresses the importance of having that overflow hose. But also if you think about it, most houses that have, if you have over a thousand square feet or, or even as little as 800 square feet, you're gonna have more than one gutter that manages your roof. So if you think about it that way, if you have two gutters on your roof managing the 800 square foot, maybe 400 square foot's going to one gutter where that would be going to one rain barrel and then the other 400 square foot's going to the other. So it would be like 125 gallons going towards that rain barrel instead of 250 to think about it that way as well. So that is sort of a good way too to put it in the perspective how much water is actually running off your roof and how even having this rain barrel and storing that 55 gallons and then diverting that other 70 gallons or whatever you have coming off your roof through your yard instead of directly into the storm system is helping to alleviate some volume issues and flooding issues in our local creeks as well. So then we sort of just have a nice graphic here showing the roof catchment area. And then you can't quite see on here, but there'd obviously be multiple different gutter points where water would drain off as well. So now I'm just gonna talk briefly about a couple of uses for rain barrels here, uh, the water from rain barrels that is. So one of them is that you can use it to wash your car. Um, so if you think about it, the water that's coming out of your rain barrel, 
Usually you'd use like a watering can if you don't have anything specific, but I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later. There are some options that are like $100 or maybe a little bit more, but you can pressurize the rain, the water coming out of your rain barrel, so you can use it out of a hose to like squirt down your car or do something else. So you can also use the water from the rain barrel then to bathe your dog or your pet. Maybe you can wash some other things outside. You can water your lawn as well. Um, you can certainly water your flowers in your garden. Um, so we're gonna talk about a different feature that you can add in later that sort of slowly irrigates the flowers as the water leaves the rain barrel and slowly releases it. One thing you can also do, um, which I'm gonna stress that it's recommended that you get your water tested. Um, you send it to like a lab or something where they can test your water to make sure that there's no contaminants in it. But you can, after it's tested and it's deemed to be safe, use it to water your vegetables as well. But you wanna make sure then that you're washing your vegetables inside. So sort of some of the things that can come off your roof, um, there's certainly a lot of dirt and debris that might end up in, at least on the screen of the rain barrel, but also you never know if there's any chemicals or anything on your roof. So you wanna be extremely cautious and have the water tested if you're thinking about using it for anything that's consumable. Um, the water in your rain barrel too, you should not drink. It's not potable water as is either. So now I'm just gonna talk about some basic maintenance steps sort of to take for your rain barrel once you get it installed. So they talked about in the video then, uh, winterizing your rain barrel. So there's a couple different things that you can do for winterizing your rain barrel. So one of the things that you can do is that you can just flip your rain barrel over outside and then disconnect the gutter itself. Um, so they mentioned replacing that section of gutter. And also we're gonna talk about in a little bit here, you can also get a diverter where it can just switch off from going to the rain barrel and go back to the normal gutter as well. Um, so when you go to winterize your rain barrel too, I should have said this first, what you wanna do is completely drain the rain barrel so there's no water in it. Um, so that's a good time then to do a cleaning of the rain barrel too. Um, so you should at least clean your rain barrel like inside at least once a year. So what you'll do for that is you'll take a mixture of like warm water and then vinegar sort of mixed one to one and just scrub it out with a brush inside to make sure if there's any algae growth or there's any dirt that you're getting that all washed out in the off season as you're winterizing your barrel as well. So I mentioned you can flip the barrel over and leave it upside down. You can also just wrap the barrel in a tarp once it's disconnected and cover it with bungee cords then. You just wanna make sure during the winter that there's no water getting inside of your rain barrel. Um, various different kinds of rain barrels, the strength of the plastic that they're made out of, they can break in the winter if they freeze. So you don't really want them to freeze. You don't want them really to be that exposed to the elements. You can take the rain barrel and put it in your garage as well. Um, so typically most of the rain barrels are made out of like recycled food grade barrels. So they're pretty strong plastic and they shouldn't break, but you don't want to put yourself in that position where there's a bunch of water that freezes in it and then it does crack and then you're sort of out of luck with it then. So then as I mentioned before, you want to make sure too for your rain barrel to be functioning properly, that your gutters and downspouts are clear from debris and leaves. And then also that top grate on top of your rain barrel is also free. And then you just wanna make sure too that all of the different spigots and attachments, you, you know, your overflow hose, it's not leaking at all. And then your spigot's not dripping at the bottom as well. So one of the questions that a lot of people usually ask about rain barrels is, what about mosquitoes since it's standing water and you typically use them most during the summer? So a lot of rain barrels, and I'll just backtrack to this slide real quick. You see that screen on top? So what that does is it really stops mosquitoes from getting in, but in some cases they can get in through like the spigot or other areas and then lay eggs in the rain barrel. And so you can use these mosquito dunks and you can put one in and it'll help to get rid of the mosquito problem. Also, another different tip you can use is one to two cups of vegetable oil. If you put that in the rain barrel, what it does is it creates like a, a surface layer on top of the water and basically it suffocates the mosquito larvae and it doesn't do anything to the water. The water is safe to use then. It doesn't really affect the water at all. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ways that you can sort of barrel for say. Um, so they sort of range in like differing prices. Um, so first we're gonna talk about some diverters here. So typically diverters, um, you can find a couple different kinds at like your local hardware store. Um, you can usually find them if you Google online too. 
they range, I think, usually from like 20 to 50 bucks, depending on the one. Um, so there's a couple different kinds. So here we have two different kinds. So the two on the outside, these diverters, how they basically work is if you look right above where the, the two sections, the gutter split, there's a little like knob there. And if you turn it to a specific way, water either, either flows down the normal course of your gutter, or then it also goes the other course and into the rain barrel then. So the other diverter that we have here is a little bit different. So how that basically works, and you can see in the diagram here is once the rain barrel fills up, then the water can't basically go into the rain barrel anymore and it just starts heading through the actual rain gutter itself. So that's more of an automatic diverter then that you don't have to switch on or off. And so these are sort of different ways to do it. If you use the diverter, then you don't have to worry about cutting your gutter and you can just stop diverting water to it during the winter and then cover your rain barrel as well. Um, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about soaker hoses. So these are basically, if you wanna like slow release the water into your yard or if you have a garden where you wanna slow release the water. Um, so it's recommended if you're gonna like irrigate your flowers or if you did get your water tested and you were going to use it for like vegetable crop that you keep it about like two inches away from the stem of the plant. But what it basically is, a soaker hose is, it's a perforated hose that slowly releases the water out of the hose into the ground. Um, so there's various different lengths. You can get anywhere from like 25 feet to over 100 feet. So the price range is pretty vastly in that too. But you can get one for under $20 a soaker hose basically. And so you could use a soaker hose sort of as another way to slowly release the water during the summer if you're not gonna use it all immediately as well. So then here's another option. I mentioned it a little bit when I talked about washing cars. So solar pumps. Um, so these are a little on the pricey side. So they range like 100 to 150 bucks, most of them. Um, but the cool thing about them then is it pressurizes the water in your rain barrel. So you'll see the, the little unit, the green box here on top of the rain barrel. So they're solar powered, so it comes with a solar panel. And there's obviously like a whole instruction manual sort of, so I'm not gonna go super into how you install it. I'm just gonna like briefly explain it here. Um, but then you cut a hole through the mesh screen on top and there's like a pump that'll go down to the bottom then. And you attach the hose to this top little box here and then it pressurizes the water so you can squirt it out or you can use it in like a low pressure sprinkler as well. So it's a good way to sort of get the most out of the water that you're gonna use out of the rain barrel then. So it's a little bit of an investment, but like we said earlier, in the long run, it'll save you money then because you're just using this rain water instead of using water from the tap as well. So then now I'm just gonna go briefly into painting your rain barrel too. Um, so there's a bunch of different sort of styles of rain barrels. There's a bunch of different colors and stuff. So the Camel's Hump rain barrels that we deal with are like bright red or like a, a burnt orangish kind of red. Um, so you could paint that. There's a lot of other places that do painted rain barrels too. So like I mentioned before, you can kind of think of the rain barrel as it's helping the environment and it's saving you money too, but you can also tie it sort of into the design of your yard if you want to tie it into like a, a water feature or you want to landscape it with some native plants or shrubs around it, or you can paint a nice design on it like this as well. So then one of the cool things too about painting your rain barrel, um, through some of the research I was doing, there was a study from the University of Tennessee that said that painting your rain barrel because you're putting you know, primer on it and then you're painting it and then you're putting another coat on top, it can help to prolong the life of your rain barrel and reduce like damage from the sun on the plastic as well. So just sort of going briefly through the steps here, when you first get your rain barrel, you wanna scrub it with warm water and a vinegar solution just to clean the barrel. That way you have a nice clean surface to paint on. Then you'll go with some fine grit sandpaper and sand over the barrel and rough it up a little bit. Then you're gonna wash it and use a brush sort of to scrub all the, the sanded material off. And from there, you'll put on a coat of plastic primer, uh, like primer that you'd use on different plastics. And then from there, you'll add some acrylic paint. So you can do like a couple of these examples here. You can put like a, a base coat of paint, and then you can paint some really cool designs on there as well. And then after you have all of the paint done, it's all dry and stuff, you'll apply between one and three different coats of acrylic or polyurethane sealer 
then so it doesn't chip and it doesn't get weathered as much. And that's sort of where it prolongs the life of the barrel then and slows down the weathering process on the barrel as well. So now I'm just gonna answer the sort of basic question, where can you get a rain barrel then? Um, so briefly too, TTF sort of works in both Philadelphia and Montgomery County. So I work specifically in Montgomery County. In Philadelphia, we work with the Philadelphia Water Department on engaging people with sort of Taconi Creek Park, which is the park in the city, and we help to get them sort of the resources that they need. So if you live in Philadelphia, or you know someone who lives in Philadelphia who wants a rain barrel, you can get involved with the rain check program. So what that basically is, is if you fill out a form for this program, they'll come out to your house, give you a free rain barrel, and they'll even install the rain barrel for you. Um, they'll give you some instructions on like maintenance and how to care for the rain barrel. So it's a pretty great program to get a free rain barrel if you live in Philadelphia. So we have all the partners here at the bottom and then we have some contact information on that. So like I said, if you know anybody who lives in Philadelphia who wants a rain barrel, you can get one for free. You don't have to buy one. So then as I mentioned too, we sell Camel's Hump rain barrels on our website. Um, there's a couple local businesses that sell Camel's Hump rain barrels too. So Camel's Hump rain barrels, as Kevin mentioned earlier, there are 58 gallon barrels. Um, they're recycled olive oil barrels. And just to talk about some of the specifics on it here, so we have the screen on top, so that filters the water, stops mosquitoes and whatnot from getting in. We have the spigot on the bottom, and then we also have two different ports up at the top of the barrel where you can connect multiple barrels or you can use it as an overflow section as well. And then we also have the one at the bottom as well for an overflow or to help drain the barrel as well. Um, and so we do have a link on our website if somebody wants to throw that in the chat now as well. Um, we sell the rain barrels on our website. Um, so they're $81 with tax. And so we do have some rain barrels in stock right now. If you wanted to order one tonight, you could, and I could deliver it to you. I've been driving around and still just dropping the rain barrels off on people's porches if they want them now, since it is the beginning of spring. So if you order one, if you go on our website and order one, you can have it by Friday if you'd really like. And then also, so all three of our organizations between uh, the Penny Pack, West Hicken, and TTF, we all work in Abington. So the Abington EAC has a pretty robust rain barrel program as well. So they sell rain barrels. There's a picture of it there on the right. Um, so they also for a charge then paint the rain barrels too. So they're a little bit different than the Camel's Hump rain barrels. If you're interested in that, you can go on the Abington Township website or you can Google it and it can give you some more specific information about the price and ordering a rain barrel from them. But the Abington EAC is a great organization too. So if you want to get one from there, you can as well. And so now I'm just going to open it up to questions. I see that the chat has really been sort of blowing up over here. <laughs> a lot of questions. I can see what I can answer. And Lindsay and Kevin, if you want to unmute, we can sort of answer them all together then too. All right. So there's been quite a few questions in chat. Um, so first of all, um, Julie wanted me to stress that um, you should not use the water on your vegetable garden. Um, before you get it tested. And then we also had some questions about where do you get your water tested um, and is there a testing fee? So that is a good question. Um, I didn't specifically like look up specific resources to tell you because it might be different based off of the area that you live in, but a simple Google search would probably give you the resources to get it tested. There are lots of private labs and they may be kind of expensive. I don't know what, we, we have our, you know, water quality in the streams go to labs to, to sample, but we are testing for really specific parameters of like things we're looking for in the water. Um, so I don't know what just like a general, you know, test battery would look like if they would be testing for heavy metals or certain compounds and chemicals. So, um, it may be specific to you know what you want to test for. I always tell people just because it's free. Um, but at Home Depot, um, I've seen these tiny little free home water testing kits. Like if you walk into Home Depot, they have them usually near the front, and it's a tiny little vial, and you can fill it up with water and send it in. It's supposed to be for your home tap water, but if you fill it up from your rain barrel, you know they wouldn't know. Um, and I'm not sure what that test battery is, but that's free. So that's usually what I tell people. 
<laughs> Thank I don't you even all. know if Home Depot is open right now. So in the <laughs> meantime, don't use it on your vegetables. <laughs> you have better play it safe and not use it on vegetables. Yeah. Um, all right, so Greg has a question and he asks, um, do most rain barrels already come with a spigot or do you have to buy them separately? Everyone I know of comes with a spigot. Um, most of those organizations that we mentioned, you know, PHS and Abington EAC and uh, Camel's Hump, they do the full uh, work of kind of getting food grade barrels. So like they, it's their second life, uh, the Camel's Hump barrels or olive barrels. I think some of the barrels that other people get may be from like Coca-Cola or Ocean Spray. They're all like food grade plastic, which means the plastic won't leach into the water. Um, but they do the work of kind of cleaning the barrels out and drilling all the holes for all the fittings and putting all of those fittings in. So it should be ready to go when you buy it. So one of the cool things too, um, Camel's Hump does sell, we don't sell directly through Camel's Hump, but on the Camel's Hump website, they do sell all the fittings that they use to make rain barrels. So if you had your own barrel that you specifically wanted to use, you could buy the whole fitting kit or you could sort of Google it too and pull together all the different aspects if you wanted to make your own rain barrel too. Awesome, so we have a question from Kathleen. And Kathleen wants to know, what is the UV resistance? I assume the UV resistance of a rain barrel. Uh, so I know that some of the barrels that um, the Abington EAC uses, because you know they, they just get barrels donated from companies like I mentioned, some of them are kind of whitish. Uh, so those are a little more like permeable to light. And uh, I think someone in the EAC mentioned that those can get a little more uh, even like algal growth in the water because the like white barrel is a little bit see-through. Um, the one from Camel's Hump and the blue barrels, uh, other barrels that are like very pigmented are not translucent at all. They're very opaque. Um, so in terms of the water, you know, getting any UV light, um, it's you know basically just any tiny opening in the top in that screen would be it. In terms of like the UV resistance of the barrel, like how it holds up to sunlight, um, like I mentioned, it is a food grade plastic. So it's made not to leach the plastic when it's like in the sun into the water. Um, and also like Ryan was saying, when you paint the barrel, that may further protect the plastic from, you know, weathering over time. I don't know if that answers your question. Cool, thanks, Lindsay. Kathleen says it does. Oh. <laughs> Kathleen also had another question about the spigot on the camelback. Um, she wanted to know, is it brass or plastic? So the, the spigot on them are brass. Great. Um, and then we have another question. We have a question from Susan. Um, Susan wants to know, um, I'm helping, am I helping the environment by continuing with not having them attached to my gutters? I have two that fill and I use them with water just as if the rainwater, as if the rainwater, as if just does not run off my roof. I'm, maybe I'm reading that wrong. Yeah, so I guess she's asking, you know, the, the, the rainwater that's coming uh, off of her roof isn't being captured. So is that still helpful? Um, it's still capturing. So the whole, the whole objective of, you know, using these green infrastructure practices is to make sure that the water that lands on your property has time to filter into the ground on your property. So, you know, the water that you're catching may be in the middle of your yard that's just going right into the rain barrel. You're still capturing that on your property and holding it back to use later. So you're still capturing, you know, 55 or more gallons of, of water on your property. Um, I think the added benefit of attaching it to those impervious surfaces is that the water that would have been falling on your lawn was going to hit your lawn and 
hopefully would soak in. Uh, we know that lawns don't absorb that much water. You know, an added benefit of using green infrastructure is to kind of turn that uh, roof or driveway or sidewalk or whatever is not soaking up water into something that will help trap water. So it's not like you're not still gathering water. It would just be even better if you were capturing it from a surface that's running off. All right, it looks like we have one more question. Um, what kind of attachment is used within the barrel that attaches the spigot? Um, is that also brass or is it plastic? So it looks like the attachment inside. I think it's brass. I mean, so like the, the thing that it's screwing onto, within I think it's also a brass fitting or is it plastic? Do you guys know? Ryan has most recently seen a camel's hump barrel, so I'm gonna defer. <laughs> so we mean like the the inside um, fixtures on it. Then is that what we mean? Yeah, the inside. I could not truthfully tell you that I haven't looked inside <laughs> a barrel in a while. When I'm after delivering them, I'm not taking the tops off, unfortunately. <laughs> so I think the. Um, like the bearings that are on either side of the rain barrel itself, I kind of remember it being plastic with like little rubber stoppers that go on the barrel, but the actual things that are screwing onto each other, I believe are brass, just because it's a lot of wear and tear from like the hose and the spigot and stuff. But, so I guess parts of it are plastic, parts of it are brass. But I could be totally wrong because I haven't seen one <laughs> in like a year and I'm stuck at home. It's all good. Do folks have any other questions that you want to type in? Um, and we also do have one more poll. I don't know when uh, we want to launch that. So before we launch the poll too, um, just the PWD rain check website has some other great resources on like rain barrel use. And on their website too, they say like to not really use the water from a rain barrel to use on your vegetable gardens too. Um, so it's sort of a contentious topic. Um, so if you don't feel super comfortable with it, don't use it. Um, it's easiest just to use it then on your regular garden as well. Good call. Julie, do you want to launch our poll so we can see how much folks learned today? All right, do we have any other questions? Anything else before we wrap up? Awesome.
Cool. Thank you all for taking part in this today. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank Bye, you all. Bye, everyone. Until the next webinar. Mm -hmm.